here's the deal. I was talking about Pretty Boy Floyd. Now, I was going by everything I knew, everything that I was told, everything I could figure out. Now, I knew that Ariel was the principal songwriter for most of those songs, if not all. Here's the thing. Okay, I get a guy, Mike, <laughs> I'm so bad at names. Dude, I'm sorry. I've been talking to this guy for like years, a couple of years at least. Well, yeah. Weren't you the guy that uh, was sending you flyers and you were going to make a book and you never sent one to me? Is that you? Uh, Mike Schneider. Buddy old, buddy old pal, buddy. So, um, I tell the story about Pretty Boy Floyd. Mainly just to, you know, for my friend Katrina, because she likes them. And I, you know, you heard what I said, I think, I hope, that they were a manufactured band, and that all the songs that they had on the first album, they stole from Ariel, who was the guitar player for Carrie Dahl. Now, here's the thing. If I'm not involved with the band, or whatever i don't care i don't know the history once i'm in or out of the situation i am gone i could care less okay so 1982-83 carrie doll is big in 82 but he sucks as a vocalist and i say he, he had more effects pedals than more most guitar players i knew but he looked cool and he had a great show so I kept thinking and telling my friend, we got to get in this guy's band. And, you know, I was like 17, 18. I was 18. So I keep bugging Carrie. Every time I see him, dude, let me audition. Dude, let me try out. And he's like, eh, it's, nah, you know, guy got a band, da, 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 da. Finally, he says, I call him up. I'm like, are you going to be at the Troubadour tonight? Because I think, I think... Wasp was playing. If it wasn't Wasp, it might have been Dubro. It might have been who, anybody. But it was 1983. Late 83, from what I remember. And uh, me and my friend, I was playing guitar. My friend was playing bass. I'm like, I want to try out for guitar. He goes, okay, uh, I'd like, do you have a tape? I'm like, a tape? <laughs> I didn't. I hadn't even thought of making a demo. And I'm eight, 19, 18 years old. So I'm like, how about this? I got a, you know, Walkman, not a, a Rockman, the Tom Schultz Rockman, plug guitar in. At the time, it was, you know, an incredible deal. But uh, <laughs> I said, how about if I bring that and my guitar... We'll go out to the parking lot and uh, I'll just play you, some, you know, some stuff on the guitar so you know I can play. And he's like, "Sure." So we meet up at the Troubadour that night. It was me, my friend, the bass player guy, and my girlfriend, who was, turned out to be my first wife, the chick that you know, like Randy Rose. She got me on that picture, all that stuff. Very cool girl, Margie. So. We go out to the parking lot across the street. I don't know you guys, the old guys that used to go to the Troubadour. There was a parking lot across the street. And uh, there it was. So we went there. I remember. I'm leaning. I'm sitting on the hood of my friend's car with my star. My Charvel star. And uh, playing. And he's got the rock men on. So he can hear what I'm playing. All I hear is... And I hope I'm doing something. I don't know what it sounds like. But he's like... I don't know if any... Look up Carrie Doll. Look up an old picture. He looked friggin' cool, man. He kind of looked like, like a, a strange Joan Rivers of metal. And he wasn't really metal. He was more like a hard rock. I don't know. 
And he did glam stuff. Sometimes he'd wear a leather skirt and pumps. But he got the attention. He'd come out of a coffin. It was the whole thing. He he uh, did an abortion on stage. That was in when I was still in school. Because I was like, holy crap, man. And I was telling everybody. What, like, I saw the thing. Carrie Dolls, guy's unbelievable. But I knew he'd go nowhere because his voice was so bad. And the band was always, eh. So this whole Ariel thing, I knew who Ariel Styles was because of my goofy friend Ace, and he's just everywhere. He never did anything. He's really never done anything. I, I hate to say this, but he has done a few things just because he was always around, always involved in something, but he really didn't know anybody and blah, da da I'm not going to go on about this because I need to talk to him about stuff because there's a lot of stuff floating around the internet about him and I'm not going to make any judgment calls until I talk to him personally. But anyways, I met a few people through him just because this guy was everywhere. Ace. And you'll figure out his last name. He's everywhere. He claims to have done everything and been everywhere and seen everybody and whatever. So, <laughs> he only knew the truth. So, so the Carrie Doll thing, no, the Pretty Boy Floyd thing. So, I didn't hear of Pretty Boy Floyd at all until they opened up for Fatal Attraction at the Roxy. And uh, that was it. I'm like, Pfft. but my old bass player, Tony, because now, of course, if I'm playing bass in Fatal Attraction, he's doing nothing, right? Right. So he's in the audience, and he's like, man, that bass player. And I'm like, got it. So we find out where are they playing next. They're playing at Waters Club, which is a junk hole down by the pier, literally by the L.A. Harbor. And uh, we went there, and there was like 10 people. So I'm like, what's the deal? So that's when we got backstage. And of course, my friend Tony, he had a backstage pass in the form of a mountain of powder. And we went back and I was going to get to the bottom of this. Because at the show, I didn't really have time or care. I was just interested in like, who are these guys? Why do they have all this equipment? This doesn't make sense. And why are they playing songs that are Carrie Doll songs? Because not only were they playing songs that Ariel wrote, I never met that guy. I don't know who the hell he is except for that he was in Carrie Doll. Okay, so to tell, finish the story with me auditioning, Carrie said, yeah, you're cool. Come down next week, and uh, you know we're also looking for a bass player. I'm like, coincidence, this guy, my friend here, is a bass player. Oh, okay. Because I'm going to go in a new direction. I'm thinking, obviously, Carrie's going to go heavy. So now we're back in 1983. End of 83. So, you know, me and my girlfriend and bass player guy, we go, you know, I'm pushing in my Marshall stack. No, I brought the half stack, the white half stack, which is very impressive. And it was modded. And I sounded friggin' amazing. In fact, I sounded a little too. Mick Mars ish, but whatever. Hey, he loved Molly Crew. Um, so I went down and auditioned, and it was great. But he had a keyboard player. I don't remember the guy's name. He was in some idiot band like St. Valentine. I'm sure Mike Schneider will know who that idiot is because. You know, I auditioned, but da, 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 a couple of days later, he calls back, and he's like, well, you were a little too heavy for the band. I'm like, too heavy? He goes, yeah, your guitar playing is a little too heavy. We want to go more pop. I'm like, what do you, what? You know, I'm 19, 18, 19, 18. I was furious. I'm like, dude, you don't know what the F you're doing. Why are you doing? He goes, well. I was talking with the keyboard player, Mr. Dick Knows. I can't remember his name. And uh, he, we've decided that we want to go more pop. 
so we're going to go with this other guitar player. I'm like, who? And he told me the name, and I'm like, it sounds like a girl's name. Which would not be out of, you know, it's glam. But it was a girl. I'm like, oh, you're blowing it, dude. You're a dick. And bam! And I hang up, and I throw my Iceman across the room. <laughs> Stupid. I was pissed because I thought... Not because I got turned down, because who cares? It's because he didn't want to follow the direction I think he should go in. So once that was done, that was done. I didn't care less if he was, you know, smashed and killed in a freaking car accident and carried off. Not really. It's just I was done. Onward. And my friend, the bass player, he was going to join the band but didn't because it was loyalty to me. I'm like, dude, if you want to, but they suck. They're going to go all poppy and stupid. And they did. Carried all came out wearing, uh, like, lace and, you know, he was going real glam, if you want to. But it was like he was wearing lingerie. But so was the girl. She's a girl. And the songs were really not good. So, uh, you know, I because I went to the show, I last... No, I didn't. I was so mad I didn't even go because he put me on the list. I didn't go in. We looked through the back window of the Troubadour. There's actually, there was a window where you could look and see the band. I'm like, what an idiot. He just blew it. So, my friend took off on a thing, you know, mission for two years. And, uh, you know, I was going to be a father, so I just dumped music for a while. And uh, that was the end of Carried All and everything, for as far as I was concerned, because the whole music thing was up in the air. Because I just had a, you know, I was going to have a baby. I was going to be a father or something. So, okay, now Carried All to me is out of, he doesn't exist. As far as I was concerned, he... After that band broke up with the girl, I didn't know he even played in any other bands. Had no idea what was going on. Someone told me, dude, look at he he's doing this. And I'm like, he's a little late. That's just Motley Crue. And I was offering him that in 1980 friggin' 3. He could have already been there. Plus he sucks. And he just, you know, he he's a nice guy, but, eh. So, apparently, that's when Ariel was in a band. I want to say Ariola. Let's just say that for me. Ariola was in the band with Carrie in the mid-80s, let's, I guess. I was busy with my band, so I could care less. Apparently, he wasn't doing very well because I never saw him play the strip. And if they, and like I said, wasn't my band. I I didn't know or care. I didn't even care about the bands I were opening or playing with this. It was just I was too focused on what I was doing. So Mike writes back because I, you know. I said all the crap that, you know, Pretty Boy Floyd, I knew that they had backing. They were a manufactured boy band, basically. And uh, they stole all their songs from the guitar player from Carrie Doll. That's what I meant to say. I think I said. I haven't listened to it since then. Anyways, Mike goes, it was Ariel, Ariola. They ripped off. Uh, Styles, I guess. Ariola Styles. <laughs> wrote a majority of those songs well before Pretty Boy Floyd. I thought he was singing uh, Peanut Butter something, but I'm like, PBF? Peanut Butter? Oh, Pretty Boy Floyd. That's how I am. Even though... Even the... Let's see. Well before Pretty Boy Floyd was even thought of. Styles had those songs going on with Carrie Dahl. Eventually, Dahl disbanded and Styles took his songs and eventually formed a new band with Steve Summers. I never heard that. And Steve was the guy I was talking to backstage 
down at that club while my bass player was hitting on uh, the bass player was called his name Vinny. So while Tony was hitting on Vinny and coking him up good, I was talking to the singer. And they were highly disappointed because they just got through playing for like 10 people. And most of them were their crew. And then me and Tony. Um, okay, so he says Ariola forms a band with Summers. And Carrie Kane. And the blonde haired bassist. Which Tony might or might not have had uh, relations with. Uh, Vinny Chaz. So I say they did. There was a lot of that. I mean, there was guys... Let's just say there was a guy in a band called Ruby Slippers that was in love with me. And kept coming up to me at the... Uh, Rainbow, and I'm like, dude, not, you know, no, no big deal, you know, my bass player, he's like, no, I, you, and I'm like, eh. but then these two chicks came by, and they kept, one of them, really annoying, and I wanted to get rid of her, so I said, dude, put your arm around me, he's like, really, so he puts his arm around me, and the girl's like, oh, I understand, I'm like, and then he's like, so do you want to, I'm like, no, I just wanted you to get rid of the girl for me, he's like, okay, that's cool, I understand. I can't remember the guy's name, but he was a nice guy. You know. A lot of that went around. I was totally, didn't even think that half of the guys down there were bisexual or homosexual. I didn't, because I was raised in a bubble. <laughs> Born in a bubble. Okay, so, then he says that, uh, blonde hair, okay. Kim Fowley, who I actually had contact with, and he was interested in both Trick or Treat and Fatal Attraction. Of course he would, because he worked with Kiss. He was into that theatrical crap. I think he worked with Alice. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on anything, because I really don't know. But I know he worked with Kiss. So Kim Fowley suggested the name Pretty Boy Foil. Pretty Boy Foil. Oh my gosh. To Areola. In 1988. Well, that's when they opened for us at the Roxy. So, and when they played, Ariel was not the guitar player. It was Christy Majors. Christy Majors? What are you, one of the friggin' uh, Charlie's Angels? For crap's sakes. It, it is a cool name. Michael D is so plain, but hey. You know, whatever. So, guitarist Christian Majors. And after eight shows, they were snatched up by MCA Records. I'd be pissed off, too. Okay. So, that's what Mike says. Mike Schneider. For all I know, he is absolutely correct. But, from what I heard, and my friend Tony, now, you know, so... I'm drilling the singer, I already forgot his name, Steve, I think. Where, you know, where'd you guys come from? Back East. Well, where'd you get all the backing? He's like, oh, we got somebody, you know, but da 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 Okay, so, as far as I knew, they hadn't really played out anywhere. I mean, when they played the Roxy, they sucked. It, but they looked incredible. And they had a good, you know, they had a full-on set. Full, you know, Marshalls and Ampegs and new guitars and this and that. This was not a struggling band. Balloons, buttons. I've got one of the buttons. A little pink Pretty Boy Filet button that someone handed to me. I'm like, really? Thanks. But I kept it. <laughs> um, so, I'm thinking the truth lies in, in there in between that story and what I heard. That they had backing, that they were working with Fowley, that they were probably doing this with Ariola in the band. <laughs> I don't know him. I hope he doesn't see this. And the, oh, quit calling me Ariola. Ariel. And that, just like everybody else, like Mandy, he had the 
Chet Thomas, I think his name was. Thompson, Thomas, whatever. Amazing guitar player. I can't remember the bass player, but he was really good, too. And the drummer was really good. That was his third or fourth rendition of uh, World War III. When Hollywood Records came up to him, Hollywood Records being the Disney's record company, their venture into Hollywood and, and sweeping up some of this money to, to be had on the strip, doing it a little late, but World War III was their first metal band that they signed to the label. And they said, look, we want to take you, Mandy, and build a band around you. Which wasn't surprising because Mandy had put World War III together. It was a good band, but there was no leadership like in Trick or Treat. I was writing the songs. I had a, a vision. There was no vision. All the songs with Mandy were about sex. And they were really bad lyrics. Really bad. At least with my band, you know, they were they were themed, but they were dark themed. You know, Hellfire, Black Mass, you, you get where we're going. And, uh, what's his name? Brian Warner. <laughs> Marilyn Manson, he came out, he would come out to the West Coast. And uh, I think he stayed with his grandparents or somebody because he wanted to see what the scene was out there here because it was huge and he lived in Florida so he came out and he saw trick-or-treat he mentions us in an interview I was able to get backstage when he played the palace and talk to him I'm like dude I was trick-or-treat the guitar player for trick-or-treat and I just shaved my head but I had the long tail and he's like no wait well, you don't look I'm like no he's like where's the singer I'm like he's in a band World War three that they're done. He blew it. Because this is, by this time, you know, Manson, this was like 95, 96, 95. Because they were doing the first tour before Antichrist Superstar. So, yeah, that's when he's like, dude, I was totally influenced by that band Trick or Treat because you guys weren't holding back. Like, Motley Crue was dancing around the devil. You guys were, like, singing about him. And we were. It was, like, hardcore. We even had the guy from the Church of Satan at our shows. Anton LaVey was at the tr the last Troubadour show we played. He was going to back the band. Is that good backing? <laughs> I don't know. At the time, I would have taken anything. Now I think about it, I shake. Oh, my God. The the head of the Church of Satan was going to... Oh, but... I decided... in a good place to be so no so anyway so how did I get started on? okay so Mandy kicked away the entire band and let Hollywood Records set a band up around him and so they brought in Vinny Apathy and Jimmy Bain from Dio and whatever Rainbow and they found Tracy G who I will do the interview with, with for Dio because then right after Mandy destroyed World War Three, on their second date opening for Iron Maiden on the North American tour, when they had the whole tour to do, and they were getting, that would have put them on the map. They would have been huge. Now they're just a, a poop mark on the stain of what happened in Hollywood, really. So, and if it wasn't for Hollywood Records building that band around him, but it never happened. So this is what I'm thinking happened with. Pretty Boy Floyd because it doesn't make quite sense. It does make sense what Mike's saying, but what Steve was telling me and the guitar player. That's right. It was the guitar player because I'm thinking there's a blonde, there's a dark, there's a dark hair, dark, dark blonde. Drummer I never talked to. It was the guitar player and the singer because I knew I didn't want to interrupt Tony. So, because he was Chaz, Tony, get it? This is all happening at the Waters Club, and I'm talking. And I'm like, you know, trying to get it out of them. They didn't mention Kim Fowley. They just said, we've had backers, and we've been working with these people, da 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 They had already been signed. As far as I knew, they said they already had a record deal. They're just, they're recording it. It'll be out. 
So playing eight shows, unless, I don't know. Because the show that I talked to him at was three shows later. And I don't, I've never heard of them before they played. Now, that doesn't mean they pl didn't play out. They could have played the Troubadour on a you know, Tuesday night or a Monday night opening for nobody. Who knows? But their first big show where they had a sold-out crowd because of fatal attraction was the Roxy. And then I never saw him play for a sold-out crowd until after the album, and it still wasn't sold out. And I don't remember why or how I saw him, but so there you go. So, you know, relying on my, on me and my memory, that's why I always ask people, do you remember this? Because I remember it like this, but I was, you know, <laughs> you know. And boop, chicks. I was living it, you know? And it was, it was stupid. I wish I didn't. So I, I usually have like three or four guys, like if my roadies didn't remember, and my roadies are dying off. So like I'm like, do you remember that? Yes or no? They really didn't care. They were kind of like, you know, get the stuff off, stay on the stage, and then party. So I ask roadies, I ask my friend, I ask any friends. Like, I've got a few friends that would go to my shows that never drank, never partied. So they're reliable sources. And then the only other guy that never drank or smoked or did anything dumb is Ace. But I can't rely on him for, for everything. I don't know if I can. i got to talk to that guy because I've known him for a long time and... I met him because <laughs> long time ago he'd always put together bands but they never played anywhere and he had a band and he had uh, got my friend Tony as the bass player but he couldn't play bass at all and uh, he kept saying he had endorsement deals but he also was in, a, in an accident and he got a settlement and he got a lot of money and the guy, the guy, the uh, attorney dude that got him that settlement helped him out by getting him to uh, invest money. This is just loose. I, I'm not sure of the, the whole thing, but he, he did two very, one or two very smart investments. He's never had to work a day in his life. But I used to rely on him for memory because I don't remember a lot of things. It's just like, well, I'm partying with this guy and these girls and why am I here? And that happened a lot. I would just like wake up out of a blackout and like, what? One time I, <laughs> I lost my car for two weeks. I couldn't find a dang thing. Me and my girlfriend. And I was so mad I didn't want to call anybody and admit that I was that stupid because I'd gotten so wasted like a party for four days and I couldn't even remember my name. And then me and my girlfriend woke up on like sunset. No, it wasn't sunset. Somehow we got up to Hollywood and we were sleeping on the street. I'm like, what happened? Where are we? And then someone like, hey, Michael. This is when I was in Fatal Distraction. Like, hey, like, we're going to a party. Want to go? Yeah. And I got in. I'm like, do you know these people good? And he's like, why? I, go, I need to take a shower. So does she. He's like, oh, really? <laughs> you know, they were smoking uh, pot. So I'm like, good, because it'll cover up our stink. Anyway, so we went to like three parties to shower every time and then just keep walking and trying to find my friggin' truck. Finally, I had to give up and call somebody that came and got us, and we got like four days sleep, eight, and then uh, I 